Welcome, folks. Um, we are um, most of, but not all of, the CNCF Code of Conduct Committee. Um, uh, the CNCF Code of Conduct Committee consists of both elected members uh, from the community, um, of whom we have four here, um, and of uh, staff members um, from the CNCF staff, um, because the community and staff need to cooperate in order to resolve incidents. Uh, so I, we put together this panel to answer some questions that we get a lot from the community. Um, this is actually towards the end of the very first term of the elected Code of Conduct Committee. Um, and, and honestly, we've been figuring out a lot how things should work. Um, and so we can actually explain how things do work now. Um, so we're going to start with a few of those questions. Um, and then if you have questions of your own, um, I, that QR code will take you to a Q&A app. Um, and uh, we will answer those questions as well. So with that, let's start with the first question, which is, how is the Code of Conduct Committee selected and how long do they serve? Bob? <laughs> yep. Well, we currently actually have a election going out, um, calling for like members to apply, looking for people with at least, uh, ideally some prior experience in the space or something adjacent or HR. Um, you can find the application on the TOC mailing list. Um, but once that happens, uh, once we have a certain number of candidates, the TOC will actually review all these submissions and then sort of like make a decision on who should be appointed to the Code of Conduct Committee. And since this is the bootstrap uh, period, we are, we've decided to, I think, st like three people decide to stick around for the additional year term and two are rotating off. So there'll be two spots free for this term and then we'll be shifting to two year terms and for the new people coming on board and company, the, the people that are staying around. Right, we have staggered terms so that to in ensure continuity. So only half the committee is being reelected each year. And, and what we're looking for is somebody who's an active member of the CNCF community um, and has, has some related experience, which could include being a project leader. Um, I, you know, and it's an important role because we're here to ensure that the CNCF remains welcoming and inclusive. Uh, it's also useful for people who, you know, are looking at maybe going into management um, because the experience of being on a code of conduct committee is, has a lot of similarities to the experience of um, having to manage uh, employees um, who may have problems and may have conflicts. Um, and also, obviously, if you're in the CNCF, it's an opportunity to support your project in a different way. Next question. What happens when somebody sends a report to conduct at cncf.io? Hi. Um, so when somebody um, sends a report, firstly, there's an acknowledgement of the report. And confidentiality is maintained throughout the process. If anonymity is requested, that too is maintained in accord with the CNCF confidentiality and sharing policy. Next, there is a jurisdiction determination. Does the report fall within the CNCF code of conduct? And if it does, any code of conduct members with a conflict of interest step aside. Then an investigation may be assigned. Either a member of the code of conduct committee or myself will investigate, or if necessary, an external investigator may be assigned. The code of conduct committee will notify the accused person of the report concerning their alleged behavior. And there's timing and details of the notification that um, are in consideration when that notification is executed. And if appropriate and agreed upon by all parties, a mediation or alternative dispute resolution process, such as a facilitated dialogue, may be offered to create resolution. 
And um, this, the Code of Conduct Committee reviews and evaluates the investigative findings, and from the investigative findings makes outcome determinations and determines remedies and resolutions. And reporters are kept updated throughout the process, and the final outcome is communicated to both reporter and the reported party. And the community also gets a summary, an anonymous summary, of anything that the Code of Conduct Committee adjudicates in the term transparency report. Thank you. Oh, and I just, just wanted to clarify roles here. So um, uh, we do have some staff that are actually voting members of the committee, but Colleen is um, an external ombudsperson, so she um, helps take, take reports and does investigation, but she's not uh, an employee of the foundation. So there's that, just that additional like neutrality she brings as an external um, trained mediator and uh, and uh, investigator, and then um, I'm a staff member of the CNCF and Linux Foundation, and I help uh, you know I help with um, coordinating between uh, staff, uh, event staff, and Linux Foundation legal if there are legal issues in the committee. But I'm not a voting member of the committee, so just wanted to clarify that. But Bob Bob is both a staff member and a voting committee member. So that's quite a process. So the question is, how long does that process take? Right. Um, the short answer is that it depends, and it depends on uh, various factors. Obviously, um, if we have very few people involved, it makes things quicker. Uh, if we have public records, it's also much easier, and again, it's quicker to, uh, to, to gauge the situation and, and address the violation. Um, if the remedies are also light, it means that less discussion and less conversations are happening, so things can be quicker. So, uh, for example, a, a very quick resolution can be someone being rude on GitHub. Uh, we have public records, we can see that. Uh, the remedy is not gonna be a, a strong one and things like, uh, issues like this one can be resolved in, even in one week. When uh, the violation is more severe, when there is, for example, a case of harassment, when there is a lot of eyewitnesses involved, uh, things become much longer because we need to conduct some interviews, we need to have multiple conversations between us and, and really consider uh, the outcome of the investigation. And uh, especially when the outcome and, uh, and, uh, and the remedy is a severe one, uh, the conversation becomes becomes longer and because some of the remedies can be uh, irreversible. So these are decisions that cannot be taken lightly. Um, one last point is that sometimes we also need to involve an external uh, investigator, someone, that, a third party that can write reports for us, which means, again, that we need to liaise with a third party and make sure that we, we get all the facts straight before we, we come to a conclusion. Uh, in these cases, for example, a case of sexual harassment, it can be months, uh, even longer than that sometimes. Thank you. Um, so the next question obviously is, what could the outcomes be if a violation is found? Now, one important principle that I want to share that the Code of Conduct Committee operates under is the idea of restorative justice, which is that it is our goal to <coughs> bring people, particularly the reporter, um, back to a state of being um, satisfied and being able to be a part of the community that they were in before the incident happened, um, rather than being fixated on following a particular set of rules except where there are legal requirements for us to follow a specific set of rules, which sometimes does happen. Um, but the goal is to find a good outcome for the community, um, including and especially the reporter. Um, <clears throat> given that um, we have a variety of outcomes that can happen um, if we find that a violation has occurred, um, Colleen already mentioned mediated discussion is one of them. Um, particularly for violations that involve groups of people. 
um, uh, where a project may be having problems with a contributor, et cetera. Um, sometimes mediated discussion could be the way to handle that. Sometimes we request or even require communications and diversity coaching um, uh, because um, there, there are definitely people out there who mean well but cause a lot of offense because of their communication style. Um, uh, sometimes incidents actually point to places where we need improvements within C and CF processes themselves. Um, I, sometimes, you know, what needs to happen is an apology, right? Um, I, you know, where a sincere apology is, is possible. Um, and then where we can't come to an ideal resolution, um, I, it can involve things like having people resign from leadership roles, um, temporary or permanent suspensions, which can either be from the CNCF in general or far more frequently from specific areas. Um, the, um, and, and that's, you know, sort of our toolbox of outcomes. Um, you know, and what we're primarily concerned about the welfare of the reporter, generally, if, if the Code of Conduct Committee is involved, the reported is a member of our community too, and if we can restore everybody to a position in the community, then, then we will do so. Um, it's just not always possible. Next question. Can I see incidents and outcomes from the past? Yes and no. So obviously any code of conduct report contains a lot of sensitive information about both the reported party and the reporter, and we wouldn't want to make that public. We do, however, publish an anonymized transparency log so that it's clear to the community kind of some of the things that are happening and that they're aware of the work that we're doing. Um, you can find all of them on the CNCF website and we publish them as soon as we can, but obviously a lot of things are ongoing and it's not just the investigation, but also kind of the uh, remediation too. And so once kind of that comes to a conclusion, then we'll post it in the transparency log. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, let's see what we have for additional questions here. Okay, so uh, for our first question, um, what is the ratio of the committee's work between active incidents and longer term projects to address larger inclusivity initiatives um, or, or issues? Does anybody want to take that? Sure, I can do it. Okay. Uh, it's like a mix, I would say, and it depends a lot on what we have on our plate. Um, if there's a specific active, active incident that we need to talk about or if there's like something coming up, um, then it can go more one way or the other. I would say we're mainly focused on active incidents um, right now. As we're kind of getting up and running, we're kind of figuring out what the process is. And I think we've also, I think people are starting to discover the Code of Conduct Committee too and the work that we can do to support the community. And so in a good and also in, in a good way that we can support the community, like more people are talking to us too. So we're, I think we're do, working a lot on active incidents right now. Yeah, um, sometimes those, those active incidents though, the findings do result in recommendations for policy changes um, to like kind of correct more at a systemic level um, uh, the, the issues that are contributing to whatever those types of incidents are. So for example, the Code of Conduct Committee has sometimes made recommendations to the Technical Oversight Committee um, about policy changes or, or, or need for you know, more leadership uh, guidance uh, to be provided to projects. Um, we are working on, uh, we are evaluating some potential resources um, that are either going to be developed by the committee or developed by, um, by other providers um, to help uh, project leads uh, resolve conflict within projects, really just giving them more support, more um, training and resources. Um, and there are sometimes policy changes that come out of incidents. So, um, I mean, some of those, like I, I can't speak about right now because they haven't been published yet, but um, the committee has definitely had an influence in shaping 
several uh, several policies um, at the foundation level or at the governing board or at TOC level. Yeah. One I can mention is um, the TOC of this concept of the technical leadership principles, um, I which covered the area of cases where somebody had not necessarily vi violated the code of conduct, but had maybe not been a good leader for a project or a committee. And the problem was that those were living in an incomplete Google Doc for like a long time, and based on actually needing to have somebody evaluated against the principles, um, we got the code of con the uh, TOC to publish a final version of the technical leadership principles. Yeah, right. So yes, but this committee and then the interim code of conduct committee both had input. Uh, in in the the technical leadership principles themselves, like what they should say. I mean, there is just general agreement that leaders have a bigger impact um, in terms of you know uh, how they lead a project is going to influence everybody's experience, and so um, they're held to an, another standard in addition to just a code of conduct, which is a baseline for all community members. Okay, so let's take another one. Um, how long has the Code of Conduct Committee been in, in existence, and uh, I, why was it formed? I can try to tackle that one. I think this is the end of the, the first year of the elected committee. If you back up from that a little bit, there was the Bootstrap Committee, uh, and the work to help define the policies for what the CNCF Code of Conduct Committee would look like. I wasn't part of that, but I would guess that some of the inspiration for that draws from the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee, which predates the CNCF Code of Conduct Committee by quite a bit, um, which has been pretty effective for the Kubernetes project in resolving issues and handling Code of Conduct incidents. Uh, but that didn't exist more broadly for other projects within the CNCF. And not every project can have a full-fledged Code of Conduct Committee. So the formation of the CNCF level code of conduct committee, I think, is, was an attempt to bring some of that sort of um, service to the community more broadly to the projects outside of Kubernetes. Yeah, I um, and I can comment a little bit more on the history. So there was a code of conduct working group that was led by um, it was a collaboration among the governing board leadership, uh, TOC leadership. Um, and um, there were a couple of ma elected maintainer representatives who served as leaders for that working group, and um, the, the current procedures and composition and rules for the Code of Conduct Committee were all collaboratively developed by the community in GitHub, um, and this is, this is the structure that resulted. Um, and, and part of the reason why the committee was formed is um, historically, um, you know, I mean, CNCF, as you all know, has, has grown like, is what? yes, <laughs> incredible growth over the last ten years. In their earlier days, um, code of conduct incidents were just handled by staff. They were just handled by a combination of then staff and CNCF leadership. Um, you know, and as this committee is is has grown, um, there was there was uh, there was broad consensus both within the foundation and 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 among the committee that um, you know. What makes us awesome is community, right? Um, and that it was really important that um, people in community not just have staff to go to, but also have community members who are peers that they can uh, report incidents to, peers who have um, who have context about what's going on in the technical community, um, uh, who are who are involved in in the resolution of incidents and also a lot of the policy work that the committee is helping influence in the background. Um, I think it's really really it's just so valuable to have community members uh, who are collaborating now with foundation staff and resolving incidents. Um, there are incidents that are resolved still resolved entirely by staff and and that's our LF events team. So um, if something happens on site, uh, like you know if somebody is, you know. Uh, engaging in, in threatening behavior and they need to be escorted off, like we can't afford for that to go through a lengthy committee decision-making process. Those decisions need to be made on the spot, you know, by professionals. But all of our event staff um, who, is who are involved in incident resolution, they all go through COC training. We also have security staff who are trained. Um, and so the things that happen on-site in events, that's, that's an exception that goes, that is handled exclusively by staff. Right. 
Um. Hmm? One other last thing that I just want to also mention that has been a great benefit of the CNCF at least getting involved in the code of conduct like area is see like Colleen and being able to, to have a third party person actually around and available to be able to help in these sort of situations. Mm -hmm. It's it's been a great resource that hasn't necessarily been available um, before and for like the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee and others. Yeah, it's uh, Colleen's contribution has been tremendous. So um, we have more than 200 projects now. CNCF is huge. <laughs> we have a giant community and there are um, you know, in any large community, there are going to be conflicts, there are going to be disagreements, there are going to be some people who, um, you know, have a contention but may still, you know, not contribute to a positive environment because they don't know better. And there may be some people who really are engaging in behavior that is just truly unacceptable. Um, and in a community this size, I would say that we actually, like, for a community this size, like, I don't think we have, like, an unreasonable number of incidents, but just because it's such a big c community and everybody who's serving on this committee, um, like they've got other roles in the community, right? Like your maintainers, your um, your your tag leadership, like you're you're wearing a lot of hats. And so, um, one of the the things that's great about this committee is that we're also utilizing um, utilizing external professional help. So Colleen has really extensive background um, in in uh, team building, in communication skills coaching, um, as well as conflict resolution. So we have that professional skill set to rely on. Um, and then she's also a certified investigator. And so some of the really complex incidents that would burn up a lot of community member time to go interview every single witness, um, it's really great having a professional resource um, who can help with that. And, and Colleen doesn't decide the outcomes, but she'll, she'll investigate, she'll produce a report, she'll gather the evidence and package it up so that the committee can have everything in one place and make decisions um, thoroughly, but also expeditiously. Although I know from the from the outside, just because of how long investigations take, it doesn't always, it doesn't always appear from the outside to be expeditious. Okay, I'll I'll say a little word about conflicts of interest um, because um, the one I, think, the I think I think <laughs> I think I conflict out more often than anyone else. Um, so this is a big concern for Code of Conduct Committee because this is our community, um, and I uh, and one of the reasons why we have five elected members is because for any given incident, um, it's quite possible. Um, I would say actually. Like for the average incident, there's probably a 50% chance that one person will have to conflict out, right? Um, uh, and we have, you know, because we have this concept of hard conflicts and soft conflicts, right? So hard conflicts are, you know, you're the reporter or the reported or have a close personal relationship with them. Um, or are a witness or somehow otherwise directly involved in the incident, right? And then there's just no way, not only can you not, you know, be part of deciding on whether it was a violation or not, deciding what's a reasonable outcome, you can't even be part really of the proceedings. Um, and so that person will actually log off of the Slack channel for a while, et cetera, um, in order to not be part of the proceedings. What we have happen much more often is what we call soft conflicts, um, where, for example, um, you know, all of all of us elected members are, and and also a, at least one of the staff members, are contributors to various CNCF projects, right? And so, if you work with somebody in a project, um, if they are, say, the reporter to the reporter, there's going to be an appearance of bias, um, and we don't want to have an appearance like. Like even if there isn't any real bias, it'll look like there's bias, and we don't want to have an appearance of bias. And so that person will opt out of um, deciding on that particular incident to avoid any appearance of bias of the committee. Yeah, and we have alternates um, who will serve in the place of, so, um, so the committee, the elected committee members, there's um, three spots that are primary voting, and so if one of them conflicts out, we already have alternates that are in place and involved who are trained in con in the code of conduct committee processes who step in. 
I, I just want to say that we're all on Team Human, and I want to acknowledge Tim Pepper, who's not here, and I just want to say that this Code of Conduct Committee has been intentioned and consciously rooted in decision-making and discussions that are always um, inclusive and in consideration of the well-being of the entire community. And I just want to acknowledge this past year, you've dealt with some very complex issues and you've given a lot of time and effort, so I want to acknowledge that. And, and that looks like all the questions that we need to answer this time. So um, with that, does anybody have any last thoughts? I would like to welcome people to reach out to us whenever the, there's the need. Even yeah. if you're not sure if it's a code of conduct violation or not, if you want to clarify, we're here. Our goal is to create as much awareness as possible about this committee and, and be really helpful to the community. Oh, there, is, there is one question I wonder if maybe we should explore a bit, which is about project leads and what oh, they can do themselves. Okay. Do, do you want to go ahead and take that? So, Joanna, do you want to start on that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, um, sure, happy to. Um, so we will, we are going to be working on uh, and publishing some guidance about this. Um, so it's available in writing. Um, but you know, project leads should feel, I mean, are empowered to do some uh, of their own enforcement. So you know, if somebody is like posting in project channels uh, content that's inappropriate. Go ahead and remove it, hide it, block them if you need to. That is completely fine, and you know something that project leads sh should be doing. Um, if there is something you know far more egregious, like you know ongoing repeated harassment, um, you know, that's something that we encourage you bring to the committee. Um, but things like you know rudeness um, in in shared communication channels, you should just feel free to go ahead and block. If, if you do have to actually, like, remove comments and maybe even block somebody from your project, please do report it to us because there might end up being follow-up on that. And if we know about it in, in when it happens initially, then we know what to do if we receive further reports. Just not blatant spam, please. Um, and the other, uh, something else that project leads and maintainers can do is you can always have a conversation with somebody. You know, if somebody is being disruptive, if they're not really contributing to positive environment, you know, go ahead and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Um, if you don't feel entirely comfortable doing that, um, the Code of Conduct Committee is here to support. Um, one of the things that we're going to be launching next year are some resources to to help uh, you with some best practices and guidance on how to have those conversations. Um, Colleen, our ombudsperson, is also available um, to help facilitate those conversations um, or provide you with coaching on how you can approach that conversation in a way that's uh, most likely to result in a, in a positive outcome for everyone. Okay, thank you. And uh, the one other thought is, um, please consider serving um, on the Code of Conduct Committee. Um, nominations are open now through December 4th? December? No, it's, uh, I think, December 20th. Oh, through December 20th. Now through December 20th. Uh, please consider serving on the Code of Conduct Committee. Um, or if you uh, know someone, that would be good. Yes, please, or please, recommend yes, somebody yes. That, that, yes, who, who would be good. Although, only with their permission, yeah. of course. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah. Um, and, um, and with that, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we are the Code of Conduct Committee. Thank you. Thank you.